as you can imagine, after that, uh, uh, after that occasion, I have uh, not had the uh, the um, pleasure of wearing uh, my wig again, and I have only grayed now so much that uh, I, I'm not even so sure that I need a wig if I do show up again at the Supreme Court. I'm extremely grateful uh, to the firm of Wale Olani Kweku and Co, conveners of this important conversation on our system of administration of justice for this very kind invitation. Uh, Chief Wale Olani Kweku is without doubt one of the most consequential lawyers in uh, not only in our country, but perhaps even in the Commonwealth. Today, his exceptional success with novel constitutional constructs is swiftly becoming the stuff of legend. But these days he is uh, doing his best, and I want him to listen to this very well. He, these days he is doing his best to enjoy the very huge fruits of his labor and has sensibly handed over the tougher parts of running the law firm to his two exceptionally brilliant chips of the old block, Dr. Dabo Olani Brekong, senior advocate of Nigeria, and Mr. Bodhi Olani Brekong, senior advocate of Nigeria. I commend you both for this exceptional idea and the execution of this summit. This, this theme covers a very broad range, and I, I'm just after listening to uh, Odita covering the wide range of issues and with such incredibly, uh, incredibly appropriate examples and, yeah, and illustrations, uh, one really would rather not uh, say anything, we'll just go straight to the discussions so that we can make uh, our contributions. So what I will try to do is to focus my comments on the responsiveness of our system of administration of justice to the ends of social justice, or the social ends that is to serve. And I'll just mention a thing or two about uh, some of the other infrastructural issues uh, at the end of my uh, presentation. We are, you know, at, 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 at a moment in history like no other, uh, a global pandemic of a magnitude probably never seen before, and the worst global uh, economic decline in a century. But economies like politics uh, is local. You, you know, here in Nigeria, we were already grappling with issues of poverty, entrenched inequality, disparities in access to social and economic opportunities, constraints to access to justice. And I think as, um, and as uh, Fidelis said, you know, not just access to justice, but perhaps more importantly, exiting uh, justice, the, the justice system. And the diminishing faith in governing institutions generally at the same time, insecurity in parts of the country, stretching our law enforcement infrastructure to its very limits. But we are also at the most technologically advanced moment in human history. And this is the same for us in Nigeria. With artificial intelligence, the internet of things, and now even 5G, redefining commerce, medicine, entertainment, and even how we work and play. It, the conflation of these events is both enormously, in my view, exasperating, but it's also incredibly a hopeful time. And for our system of justice, you know, it offers great opportunities, and uh, we must not, uh, we, we must not in any way diminish uh, th those opportunities that it offers. But we are faced today with demands for both structural and philosophical change in the in our administration of justice system, and I cannot. You know, uh, I can't but help repeating, you know, how well uh, Fidel has put a lot of these issues. But the big question is also the relevance of our paradigms of justice to the major socioeconomic circumstances that confront us. The law is a social construct and makes sense only within a social context. To treat the law as something apart from society or as a body of technical abstractions is to strip it of meaning and to alienate the, the legal order from the very people that it is meant to serve. Consequently, a definition of justice that focuses on social and economic rights of the people is not only meaningful, it is certainly more just. Of course, these rights, as we know, include the right to shelter, food, employment, education, 
a reasonable standard of living, uh, national, a, a national living wage, a national minimum wage, care for the elderly, pensions, unemployment benefits, and the welfare of the physically challenged. Our progress in the observance of socioeconomic rights must also be prosecuted in terms of the struggle to reduce the basic problems of ill health, malnutrition, illiteracy, farming, etc., which daily afflict our people. Where social and economic rights are unsecured, people are unable to fully maximize their civil and political rights. So for instance, access to qualitative education enhances and enriches freedoms of expression, thought, and culture. Conversely, pervasive illiteracy can nullify the entire to, can, can nullify the entire idea of freedom of, of, of freedom of expression. In the progressive vision, political rights and socioeconomic rights are mutually reinforcing. But socioeconomic rights, where they are wholly, even where they are wholly justiciable, mean nothing unless there is a fiscal commitment to enforcement. And so this, this is crucial, because it's a crucial, in my view, intersection of politics, of ideology, and of our notions of justice. And this may explain why the opposition in Nigeria was prepared to abolish our social investment program if they were, while our party's understanding of the imperative of delivering social justice was the provision of a massive social safety net, or at least the beginnings of the provision of a massive social safety net. This was a fundamental feature of the party's manifesto. So our social investment program, which is possibly one of the most ambitious welfare programs on the continent, and our effort to expand universal health insurance, all aim at ensuring that our most vulnerable citizens are not abandoned to the vicissitudes of fate. Consequently, socioeconomic rights, where they find uh, uh, fiscal support, is absol uh, absolutely crucial. And they, if they do not find, uh, uh, if they don't find fiscal support, obviously, uh, the whole cause is lost. It's of course evident that without social justice, uh, legal justice, uh, if uh, in any sense, is, is unattainable. The degree to which citizens are in possession of their socioeconomic rights also has a direct impact on the degree of their access to legal services and then to justice. Our constitution asserts that the independence, impartiality, and integrity of the courts of law and easy accessibility thereto shall be secured and maintained. It's significant that the framers of the constitution enshrine access to justice along with socioeconomic rights in, in the directive principles and objectives of state policy. But, in the, but it in, and this indicates clearly that they saw access to justice and the integrity of our justice system and socioeconomic rights as related imperatives. And I think that, that, that is a, that's the right construct, that's the right framework. There's also a growing recognition, especially in criminal justice, that the model of adjudication that we're accustomed to, which largely dispenses retributive justice, is not entirely adequate to meet the demands of justice in the various complex uh, scenarios and situations that confront a developing country such as ours. Given the tensions and frictions generated by contending passions and grievances in, in, and the social reality of inequality and inequity, there's also a recognition that some of the most serious situations which threaten to even sometimes you know, break the fabric of society require much more than just retributive sanctions by a judicial system. They require restorative justice to bring about healing and the reconstitution of communities. This is one of the approaches that we're looking at as part of our efforts to resolve protracted ethnic and religious conflicts. In many, many cases, it's not enough to, 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 to arrest, detain, and then prosecute uh, and, and jail uh, a terrorist or jail someone who has abducted uh, children for years. There is a need somehow to find uh, a, a process by which a restorative justice can, can be brought to bear, by which the communities can feel somehow, as, by which their, their, their feelings of violation can be assuaged. 
already the National Policy on Justice embodies some of these prescriptions and offers pathways of innovation for more holistic approaches to justice delivery. There's still much work, of course, to be done in this respect. But just to mention as I close, uh, um, uh, just a few of the issues uh, which I've described as infrastructural issues. Uh, how do we ensure that we attract and appoint only the best amongst us to the bench? How can we do, what, what can we do about unreasonable delays in justice delivery? How will technology affect our administration of justice system? What needs to be done to maintain the integrity of our judicial process, processes and outcomes? To take the easiest first, and I'm not going to make any elaborate comments, as I said, I endorse fully practically everything that Fidelist uh, uh, said. There's little doubt that technology has already permanently changed the way we do business. The Supreme Court, in the wake of the pandemic, endorsed virtual court proceedings. So, I mean, clearly, there is, at least the doors have been opened for whatever the implications of virtual court proceedings mean. Digitization of trial processes is now inevitable, and there are very many easy to use models. Uh, this will by itself, in my view, uh, impact trial times. Uh, recording proceedings will be easier, and so will several other things. And I agree with Fidelis that uh, sometimes uh, the technology might be slower than, than, uh, the, the, than manual processes, especially because we haven't got the technology right. But I think that with, with, with more frequent use, and with it, uh, uh, states like Lagos, we'll probably get it right much faster. You know, we've been at this issue of uh, digitization for uh, quite a few years now, but I think that you know, it's getting much easier to adopt uh, some of the uh, best uh, models that there are. But the important correlation between the cost regime and the speed and efficiency of trials, again, is a very crucial issue. We cannot have the cost regime we have today and expect that lawyers will not engage in dialectic tactics, especially where the lawyer knows he has no case. So really, I, again, I fully endorse what uh, Fidelis has said uh, in his presentation about how the cost regime should influence uh, uh, the, the, the way that trials run and also how, uh, how dialectic tactics are, are, are punished by, uh, by uh, the sorts of costs that uh, have to be paid by, by counsel that engage in such conduct. We must take the opportunity also to rewrite procedural rules, to remove needless processes and rituals. And I think, again, you know, to the point that uh, uh, Fidelis made, you know, the, this entire approach of just a completely technistic uh, way, uh, it, it really has, it, it has given rise to the most absurd outcomes the obsessive, and I, and I think that that's the word he used, elevation of form over substance. This is obviously uh, a, a matter that we must take uh, seriously, and it's a matter that we must address, uh, not just uh, as, as professionals, but, but we must involve all the arms of government. I, I had the privilege of speaking at a webinar on, on uh, appointment of judges, uh, I think about two weeks ago. And this matter also came up. I think it's important for us to sit together, that is to say, the, the leadership of the legal profession, uh, the executive, the judiciary, and the legislature, to take a, se a second look at, at some of these issues. You know, because really, you know, what, what, what's the point of, of, of the whole, of, I mean, if you look at judgments, just as you said, you know, some, some of the judgments where there's just been an unnecessary emphasis on, on, on technical outcomes, where in fact the entire justice of the case is made ridiculous, just made ridiculous. I think you know when when a case is decided right, when justice is done, there is certain practically everybody feels that justice has been done, and and it's not a very it's not a very difficult thing to achieve at all. I mean, I, I, and I think that every time that technical that technicality is raised over. Uh, over the justice of the case, it's, it just leaves a sour taste in the mouth, and everybody does feel that uh, something has been violated. So it's not, it shouldn't be a very difficult thing at all to get the justices of the Supreme Court and a lot of our justices to understand, you know, uh, what, what, what needs to be done and to do what is required. 
On judicial appointments, it's clear that a merit-based system is absolutely necessary. We need to insist on mandatory tests and interviews for all applicants, and I'm sure that uh, this matter will be addressed in, in detail by, uh, I, I know we have uh, someone from the UK uh, on judicial appointments who will be looking at the system in the UK, but clearly they, we need to look more carefully at how our judges are selected, and there has to be an objective process of selecting justices. And we cannot insist that the only way to become a judge is to be a career person, or at least to move from the from high court to the court of appeal and Supreme Court. You know, we must be able to bring in uh, practicing lawyers. We must be able to bring in academics you know, to be justices of the court of appeal, to be justices of the Supreme Court. And we, if it requires rewriting the rules, then let us rewrite the rules so that um, they, they, this can be made possible. Uh, uh, the, the subjects, you know, I, I think that uh, the uh, the point which has been made uh, again by uh, by Peter this uh, about the fact that we're not going to get uh, angels to reform our system is going to be done by our, ourselves. And I think we in the legal profession, you know, even if only for self preservation, even if only to preserve our own profession and our means of livelihood, if we have no higher, if we have no uh, uh, higher objectives, you know. We owe it to ourselves to change uh, all of what we're seeing. And it means engaging with the Supreme Court. It means engaging with, uh, with, with, the, with the government, with the executive power, with the legislature fully to change some of these, uh, to change some of these rules. And I think the, the, the case is very, is a very clear and evident one, that change is necessary. And that the reform of our judicial system is urgent. Every minute of delay simply worsens the bleeding. So just to say thank you again for the very kind uh, invitation and for this opportunity, and, I, and I'm looking forward to some of the discussions as we go on. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Um, it's always a pleasure to hear from you.